So good morning, everyone. Um, so I am going to well to talk about or try to propose us to talk about um, well using what we know from the evidence from studies on the relationship between working from home and travel demand patterns and mobility behavior, and what we might be able to learn or use from that knowledge, from that evidence, to think about what might be the future of mobility patterns and uh, travel behavior in post-COVID societies, or at least in vaccinated uh, societies. So yesterday when Cathy was presenting, uh, well, I, I was quite excited because many of the things you were saying, and as we spoke after your presentation, very much, I very much relate to that literature and many of the things you've, you've talked about for Brussels can be, uh, well, I've, I've encountered them while looking at Lisbon and through this literature in one way or, or another. The way I'd like to do this is by, well, I've selected two very, well, two of some of the major disruptions, COVID-19 related disruptions, but these are the, the two may, main disruptions I think might are likely to stay with us and so because of that I'd like us to to focus on them or to use them as a, our perspective in, when thinking about uh, the, what we have learned from the literature on t working from home and travel demand patterns. So the first major disruption uh, I'd, I'd like us to um, keep in mind as we go through this conversation has to do with the, the, the well the the change in working practices, particularly working from home, but also other um, more flexible working practices. So the fact that we know that, well, this is a, an heterogeneous shock. So for some industries and occupations, uh, uh, working from home will become mainstream, perhaps not on a five per week day, on a five day per week basis, but on a two, one, three. Um, but for some other industries, it won't really be much more than what we had before the crisis. So it's going to be quite heterogeneous depending on the occupations and the sectors in terms of working from home, uh, becoming mainstream in some occupations. But the, it also opens the door for other flexible working practices in terms of uh, scheduling and coordination becoming more acceptable even in the industries and in the occupations where working from home is not so feasible. So there are obvious direct effects uh, in terms of the replacement of the commuting time, both uh, in space and in, uh, and in time. So trip readjustment, the trip scheduling, or whether activities um, commuting doesn't take place. So, but there are also indirect effects that have to do with the reallocation of the commuting time that was saved and the commuting cost that is saved. In other words, uh, an increase in disposable income in terms of how so in a way, these are adjustments in terms of the time and, and uh, the income budget constraints. So where these, um, re how the reallocation of this time and saved cost is used in terms of other activities that might require or, or, or might not require travel. So this in a way, is, it's very similar to the, um, what the, the literature on working from home or telling, teleworking um, has looked at in the past. Um, and then related to these direct and indirect effects, we have this issue of shorter and medium term adjustments. And, uh, and in particular, again, drawing very closely to the literature on uh, uh, teleworking, in the medium term adjust adjustments, uh, and here also the preferences come into place and are uh, of relevance, the fact that if we take into consideration what we know from that literature, uh, it seems that we, we might have residential reallocation that actually might be more inducive uh, to travel and in particular travel by car. Um, so, the, but the first, the main disruption I'd like to um, use throughout to the conversation is to do with the change in working practices, in particular working from home becoming mainstream. Then the second one has to do with transport systems naturally, especially public transport. And here we can kind of, if we can kind of see this as a double penalty for public transport, right? It's as if now, whenever we are asking um, uh, people in travel surveys, uh, you know, what do their preferences or what do they think it's better or worse about public transport, it's as if we have another bad of public transport. The fact that now um, there is, uh, it is perceived as being riskier, less safe, and of course, we don't know if this is something that is going to draw inertia and might stay with us, or it's something that, as Katia was saying yesterday in Brussels, it seems like people have 
in a way somehow managed to overcome this uh, perception about public transport being more dangerous because of the fear of contamination. Uh, so this not only creates, uh, makes public transport less attractive, but also it creates another problem, which is we already know that in most cities, or at least in Portugal, uh, public transport <coughs> runs has, uh, very much uh, based on uh, subsidies. And we know, for example, as I mentioned yesterday, that in Portugal uh, we have had a big change in the public transport uh, system, and in particular the fares for travel carts. And there is a question about how sustainable that is financially. And in fact, this, uh, if, if we now see that public transport uh, is even being less used and substituted by solo driving, this is also another penalty in terms of uh, how we're able to maintain um, public transport uh, in, in terms of its financial sustainability. Uh, so let alone the other issues well, relating to negative externalities of seeing an increase in car use. But at the same time, and this is kind of the paradox I was trying to allude to yesterday in one of my questions, at least in some cities, and I think Lisbon is certainly one of those examples, but also cities that have also used the pandemics to invest <coughs> in infrastructure for active travel, and in particular, in particular cycling and shared mobility, um, that there also seems to be an increase in active travel. So somehow there seems to be here kind of a paradox that we might be observing an increase, a substitution of public transport by solo driving, but at the same time, at a more local level, perhaps for those who live and work uh, in, in urban areas, this 15 minute city might seem to also be taking, uh, uh, increasing. So with these two, um, this working, yeah, so, uh, I kind of said this, but if we if we now try to keep in mind these two disruptions and how they might um, uh, affect the post-COVID uh, uh, future of mobility, then uh, again, so here in this slide, I just wanted to very briefly, I mean, uh, for lack of being too superficial, but I don't think I'm making any wrong mistake um, or big mistake. If we take the, the, the evidence we know from the working from or teleworking uh, studies and travel demand, then basically we could say that the initial view in the 90s, all the initial view is very much to use uh, teleworking as a travel demand management strategy basically to reduce congestion, either by substituting for travel or by changing trip uh, scheduling, so to flatten the um, demand of the traffic demand curve during peak hours. Now, what the, the current state of consensus seems to be is that actually if we are, the, the effect seems to be more an inductive one, more of a complementary effect rather than a substitution effect. Um, of course, this depends very often also on the sp place specific circumstances. Um, but if we were to um, just generalize then in terms of what the current view suggests, and why the effect might be more complementary rather than sub, uh, substitution. In the shorter term, the, one of the main arguments is that it has to do with the fact uh, that people do less trip chaining. So whereas when they were commuting, they were doing other, uh, well, they were, they were doing other activities. So they were using the same trip to go shopping. So they were doing several things in the same trip. So the fact that now they commute less so they kind of decentralize um, the, the, the trips. And these uh, actually might lead to more total travel. Now, whether it's by car or not depends very much on the local context. But one of the main issues seems to be with the medium term effect. Uh, and in particular, the fact that um, people who tell their work uh, reallocate uh, or re re move further away from cities or from urban areas. And um, this kind of would suggest that we might, even if we have fewer trips, overall we might have more travel. And not only uh, that, but also because people then tend to move to places that have more greenery, more affordable uh, housing. These also can be places um, that have uh, less public transport available, so also the dependency on car becomes greater. And this has other impacts than on urban form, but that's a different story now. The interesting fact about this, I find this very interesting, uh, and uh, is that um, in a way this suggests there is a kind of a rebound effect. It's as if people have a fixed travel time budget, or at least a very stable travel time budget. So even if they have, a, they enjoy um, 
a, a, a savings, both in terms of their time and money, but let's say even in terms of their time, rather than use it that, using their time to do something that might be more valuable, what they do is that they end up spending the same amount of time traveling, but they just reallocate to live further, further out or... Uh, Okay, so the, which also very much helps explain the congestion also rebounding. So here I'm showing a conceptual framework that uh, in fact, João, uh, one of my co-authors in some of the work, I'll, the results I'll present in this presentation. So in this paper with João W. Silva is also going present, to present in the next session. Uh, basically here we're, this is just a, just a conceptual framing trying to summarize the complexity of uh, um, what influences travel behavior and, tra and travel behavior decisions. And naturally it's quite complex. I mean, I'm not, uh, the point is not so much to explain uh, all of the things that are, uh, are needed and uh, are important to understand people's behavior, but naturally uh, individuals and their household's own characteristics play a role. The, the characteristics of the built environment of where people live and, and where people work uh, also naturally play a role. Um, but so there is a set of factors and mechanisms that come into place and interact with each other, which is part of the reason why this is so complex. So that where people decide to live uh, and where people decide to work partly also might reflect their own preferences, even towards how they want to, to move around. So you have the feed, a feedback uh, mechanism here that makes many of these um, uh, factors and mechanisms endogenous because they simultaneously influence each other. So in terms of the methodological, how you deal with this, naturally it's quite important the methods you use and how you try to correct for these sources of endogeneity, but it's really not the point of today's conversation. So I'm gonna actually not talk about this anymore. But uh, um, yeah, but the point I wanted to make here is that teleworking frequency or the choice to telework first and then second, how often do you telework? Uh, enters there somewhere in the middle of the chain of the decision, of the decision process, right? Um, and it enters close, more closely to what we would say are short-term decisions. So, at, so if we take this as being the ultimate decision, uh, the number of trips we make for the different purposes, working, not working, leisure, shopping, the mode we use, uh, so how often we do it, how we do it, um, so the, the modes and the purposes uh, naturally are influenced by the, the frequency of teleworking, but the frequency of teleworking that might also influence where we decide to live, uh, especially if we, we, if we are prepared to accept that people just uh, have this inertia in terms of the, the time they spend traveling, then actually we might have tele teleworking frequency uh, influencing some other more long-term decisions, like for example, where to live. And this is, again, problematic because we know that those longer term decisions are the more difficult ones to revert. So once you decide, decide to live in the suburbs uh, with less public transport available, that's going to be far more difficult to change in the future if you want to then have, build a metropolitan area that is very much focused on public transport. Okay, so uh, we still, with this idea of trying to see what we've learned from these studies, uh, including our, our own studies, um, Joan's studies and mine uh, about the te teleworking and travel behavior. In this paper published in the uh, Transportation Research Part A, Policy and, and Practice, we, we used the, national, the UK National Travel Survey. Uh, so this is pre-COVID, right? So we're trying to see what pre-COVID uh, reality kind of suggested. So here, um, the reason why we use this uh, travel survey, so we, we have microdata on respondents, I think from 2005 to 2012, 2013. And we basically use one of the questions, which is about uh, how often people work from home. So on the what you see on the, on the two plots here, on the horizontal axis, this, this is the ordinal uh, variable. So the answer basically can take an ordinal uh, scale. So I never work from home. I work once a month, less than once a month, once a month, at least once a week. And then the interesting cases are six and seven or five, six and seven, because these are the weekly. So I think number six is uh, at least once per week and number seven is three or more times per week. And so basically here we are just comparing the teleworkers um, or the non-teleworkers, so respondents, so one and two, 
pretty much no teleworking. We are just looking at their home to work distances. So that's the one way commute distance and one way commute travel time. And then we're looking at weekly commuting distances and weekly commuting travel times for one worker households and two worker households. And there's not, that's just a frequency table over there in visual, in a graphic style, right? So we're just wanting to try and see whether even we, if we only look at these patterns without correcting for anything, because these are very heterogeneous groups of people, what do we observe? And what it seems to be already a case is that, okay, the, the, travel, the amount of uh, travel seems to increase, but actually for the, 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 the most teleworkers, so the ones who really telework nearly on a COVID-19 style, three or more times a week, so pretty much the full week, actually do, have, do seem to have lower levels of um, a weekly commuting distance and travel time. Now, as I probably will mention later, the sample size for this group is also very small. So this might be a pattern, but this might also suffer from small sample uh, size. And so then what we did was that we were interested, we wanted to look at the, um, so here we control, basically we're looking at uh, individuals uh, travel behavior, depending on their own characteristics and their household characteristics, the frequency of teleworking, the characteristics of the built environment where they live, and uh, then some time controls. So we do that for one worker households, but then we also wanted to explore in, two, in the case of the two worker households, whether there were intra-household effects. So we looked at the travel behavior of the partner. So here we are looking at the teleworking frequency of one of the two workers, and then we're looking at what does that make to the other uh, partner. Because it's not only that people reallocate the time they reallocate in terms of the time and the space, but also if you, are, if you have a partner, you also need to then see what happens to the division of tasks of activities between the, the couple. So here we're trying to look for inter-household effects, and then we just look at the total household uh, uh, travel behavior. So, and we look at uh, the, the um, so the variable of interest is the frequency of teleworking, but we also use a, a binary um, version where we simply consider teleworkers, those who work from home at least once per week. So basically, I think it's six and seven or five, six and seven are just collapsed as being um, teleworkers and the rest are non-teleworkers. The results are present, I'm going to just summarize here, refer only to um, the ordinal measure. But for the binary measure, I think if I recall correctly, what we find is that on average for the teleworkers, on average, their weekly commuting is about 11 miles um, uh, gr greater. And in terms of travel time, in fact, I don't remember. <laughs> but I think it's, so in terms of it's what, nearly 20 kilometers. So it's actually not, not a big difference. These are the results for the ordinal measure, though. So here on the top part, we on the top um, the, the panel, we have the, basically the predicted value for weekly commuting distance for in one worker households and two worker households. And the, the <coughs> bottom panel, it, refers, it relates to travel time. Uh, and here in this case, basically, we kind of observe again that even after we correct for the characteristics of the individuals, the household, the built environment, there does seem to be some evidence of um, uh, commuting, weekly commuting distance increasing, although again, we see that for the, 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 the really high frequency, high uh, teleworkers, it drops. But then these this, um, results were actually not statistically significant. There is an issue here with the sample size. Um, so here basically, uh, for, at least from this uh, study, um, what we kind of had is some evidence that certainly, uh, if anything, the impact is more of a, being a complementary one than a substitution one. Just wanted to show from in another paper, um, Joao, if I don't really explain this very well, you can help me. <laughs> so in this case, this was another, another paper. In fact, I think this was, these were two papers using the same approach. In this case, it's a, simul it's a structural equation mod modeling approach, in particular path analysis, which is more interesting because you can actually model simultaneously many of the relationships and compute both direct effects and indirect effects given that as we saw in the conceptual framework, there's a lot of feedback links going on there. So we, 
we know that we have direct effects, but then also there are indirect effects. So the total effect needs to take these two into account. So uh, I just tried to um, uh, highlight what for us was of interest in, ter in terms of results. So if we look in this case, again, the same data set, so teleworking frequency again with the ordinal uh, measure uh, as before, so from not teleworking to increasingly te teleworking uh, um, more, uh, up to three or more times a week. And here what was interesting in this case was that, so in the previous study, we only looked at weekly commuting distance and travel time. In this particular studies, we were looking at what happens also in terms of the purposes and modes, uh, which we did not in the previous uh, paper. So in this case, the idea was also to see at what happens in terms of the number of trips by di for different purposes and the number of trips by dif using different modes of travel. Uh, and I think in this table, I'm only showing the results for, I think, the modes. Yeah, but we then have tables for the, the purposes as well. But the bottom line was that I think first, um, so if you see the first rows here, you have the outcome variables, travel distance by car, travel distance by transit, by active modes, and then you have the number of trips as well, by car, transit, active modes. Um, and then, on, within that uh, red rectangle, you have the teleworking frequency, basically increasing from non-teleworking to three or more times a week. And then you have the direct and the total effect on each one of these outcomes. And so the first result seems to be that actually teleworking increases overall mobility, because we see that's pretty much a positive coefficient uh, for all of the outcome variables. Uh, so it also increases uh, um, mobility by public transport and active modes. But then uh, what is interesting is that in the case of car, we see that although we see that there is a reduction in the number of trips by car, the total distance by car does not reduce. So there is again this idea that although teleworkers might indeed be making fewer trips, they are actually still traveling the, uh, longer di the same distances or longer distances, which again is an indication of this uh, hypothesis about the stability of the travel time budget. Okay, so with this in mind, and we're thinking about these two main disruptions I had uh, talked about at the beginning, uh, the, the question is what might we expect and what do we already know from some of the studies, very recent studies that have tried to look at the data uh, to say something in terms of what uh, might be the the, yeah, the impacts of the pandemic and these two disruptions on mobility patterns. Well, here I think I, I just, um, I took these uh, from The Economist and in fact it, also, it only shows, I think for the first year of the pandemic, already for the first year of the, the pandemic, it's quite interesting that you see that, so um, I selected two pairs of cities, two, two cities where uh, public transport is very good, London and Paris, and then two cities where active travel is very high, so Amsterdam and uh, Copenhagen. But what is interesting is that in both cases, we see that um, the moment the lockdown restrictions started being relax relaxed, the, the fastest recovery was um, driving and traffic congestion. Uh, and in all of the cases, public transport stays behind. This, this was in 2020, so uh, for 2021, I don't have any similar analysis, although the, I don't know if you are aware of it, but in The Economist, they, they, they have this um, nor, normal, normalcy, this index. They've created an index for normality where they compare um, behavior across many domains, not only mobility, but also how much time people are standing out at home, shopping, retail. And it's quite interesting to actually to look at that one as well. Okay, but if I move to Lisbon, because this is what I wanted to talk a bit just about of Portugal and uh, Lisbon in particular, although here there's also Porto. So in these graphs, we have, we, we, well, we look at the level of road congestion in Porto and, and Lisbon for a week in October. So uh, in, in fact, I think the second week of October of this year, 2021, compared to the equivalent period, so similar week uh, in 2019, just so before the pandemic. And in both cases, we see that pretty much road congestion levels have either met the same level pre-pandemic or already surpassed. So again, uh, these are only descriptives, but it's, um, 
already indicative of uh, what might be the substitution of public transport by car trips. Then here I wanted to show you, so I've collected average, um, I collected data, monthly data, for traffic levels uh, crossing the two main bridges connecting the two sides of Lisbon, um, Lisbon metropolitan area, so, so these two bridges over here. And already if we look at um, the, oh sorry, this is public transport, already if we look at the average daily traffic by month, and here you have January 2019 to July 2021, which is the latest data I could get. You already, and the two bridges. Uh, so you already, you can see again that uh, if you compare June 21, for example, with June 2019, the levels are very close to what they were. Very, very close. And in fact, for October, so for even more recent data, they seem to be pretty much at the same level, if not more. But if you look at public transport data, and actually it's uh, quite difficult to get monthly data <laughs> for some of the operators. So here basically I have the Lisbon Met underground, the Lisbon subway in blue, the, the heavy uh, rail, uh, suburban railway uh, services for Lisbon area, Porto, uh, metro metropolitan area and Coimbra. So the third, the, the three largest uh, urban agglomerations in Portugal. Um, so that's the yellow, so the suburban rail. And then this is the subway in uh, Porto. And this is actually a light rail system also in the south bank side of Lisbon metropolitan area. And here again, monthly data from January 2019 to June, July 2021. And you see that the levels, I mean, are like half of what, what they were. Clearly, I mean, just looking at descriptive data, it does seem to be Unlike what we saw yesterday in Brussels, because I think you were saying, Cathy, that public transport pretty much seems to be very close to the levels of what it was before. Yeah. Um, so I think in, uh, I mean, the situation here does seem to be this one of a, a, a paradox that public transport is being replaced by solo driving. Okay, so then I just briefly looked at what the very recent studies that have have carried out surveys, surveys to try and uh, follow how people have been moving around, how they perceived uh, public transport and how they might behave. In fact, there, most of the studies I've found are carried out by colleagues in um, Australia, in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, so this, in a way, anything might reflect the reality there. Um, but it, nonetheless, what I have found just looking at some of the papers from 2020, 2021 seems to be that, in fact, opinions do seem to diverge. We have a, some, a group of studies or authors that are quite optimistic and don't really see this as a threat for public transport. So they do uh, kind of find that uh, in, the, the, the med in the medium to longer term, public transport will recover to the same levels as before. So their perception is that uh, uh, working from home becoming mainstream and even this negative perception about public transport might actually not be something that will affect negatively um, uh, public transport. Uh, but then we also have some authors um, actually finding that uh, there is a substitution of public transport by solo driving. Now, so I think the... the for me, the, the issue is that, I mean, it's really difficult to generalize because it's, I think this is likely to be very place specific, depending very much already on what the, what the public network system was before, the public transport system was before, but also on the political agenda in many of these cities. Um, so that's why I think it's quite interesting to look at what the different municipalities have been doing in different countries and how they are uh, well, their political agenda, effectively. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so in terms of what the, or the, the travel patterns or might be, especially if we think in this context of a transition to sustainable mobility, which we know is quite strong in the agenda of most of the cities, um, in the shorter term, what seems to be happening is a substitution of public transport by other modes, uh, especially solo driving, but also active travel modes in the cases of some cities, particularly the ones that have invested in uh, pop-up infrastructure to allocate more public space to these users. 
Uh, but we do seem to be observing some going back to pre-COVID pre congestion levels. So this might be more of a threat than an opportunity. I don't know, very place specific. In the medium to longer term, uh, probably what, at least if we are to relate this to what the literature on uh, teleworking seems to be pointing out, is that the residential relocation away from urban centers um, uh, can continue to be a problem as it was before. If this continues to happen, and if in fact the COVID and working from home does facilitate even more re relocation of households outside of urban areas, then this probably um, <coughs> will create also uh, uh, an obstacle for this transition to more sustainable mobility. There is another element of this relocation for which, in fact, I think it's very difficult to have collect data systematically, but there is some uh, debate as to whether um, the pandemic is also presenting an opportunity for the interland, interior, small, low density areas. And we do have anecdotal evidence that some people have relocated or are relocating to smaller areas. But again, we know if this happens, this rebalancing of population growth in favor of smaller areas. I don't know if this is, well, there is a whole agenda about regional cohesion picking up on this topic, but I think it's difficult to actually say something about it without being able to systematically collect data to study it. So the, um, given that this is a workshop on uh, regional science policy and practice, <laughs> I was thinking what might be some implications for policy and practice. So the first two are very obvious, are the ones I have been talking about. So basically, is it even more important now than before to seriously consider how to avoid public transport substitution, which effectively means are we finally going to take um, the courage to think about how to disincentivize car use? Uh, this is very much still a very uh, difficult and popular topic uh, that still uh, very much influences um, elections. There is the second issue uh, which I relate to policy that has to do with this uh, post-COVID or COVID facilitated urban exodus that some people are talking about. And it can be urban exodus to the periphery, suburban periphery, which is kind of business as usual. We already knew that. But now what we see, see in the agenda, um, even linking to European, the, the allocation of European funds for regional development, certainly in Portugal anyway, uh, there is this second point about can we use this as an opportunity to rebalance inequality regionally and in favor of the smaller regions. So those were kind of the, the two big things for policy I thought could be interesting to think about. Then for, for practice, in, I think there, there could be also very interesting uh, uh, implications even in the way we uh, carry out transport modeling, planning and investment appraisal. If we are prepared to question whether the value of time we use in appraisal should be changed, because you know, uh, have people actually changed? Is there a structural change in the value of time of, of people? We don't know, but uh, uh, there, could have, there can have been in fact a structural change in the value of time in people's preferences. I don't know, I'm just saying that this is something we, we ought to consider because if, if there has been a change, then we need to also think about how we are, do appraisal in the countries that use cost benefit analysis for transport investment anyway. Um, yeah, the, the other element that uh, I think could be also relevant here is that perhaps in transport modeling, we now need to include working from home as an option, as, as if it was a mode. So when we are um, modeling the travel choices, perhaps now we really need to have working from home there as an option because it, for some occupations it will become mainstream. And so that uh, probably should be more incorporated into transport modeling, transport models, transport and land use models. Um, and then I think the last point thanks to the first one, yeah, uh, whether we also might have structural changes in the, the preferences towards different modes and in particular public transport because of these double penalty it now has. These will also be depend on whether we think that um, people will quickly readjust their behavior and, and perception or if there will be some inertia that drags on. Uh, but so these are very much open questions, but I think the time to think about them is now. And I think that's it. Sorry it took so long, but uh, thank you.